I'm joined once again today by Philippe Asulin, who's an international relations expert. Philippe, last time you were on, we were discussing the re-election of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We now have seen that serve as sort of the context for this round of negotiations around Iran and around nuclear weapons and economic sanctions. And in the last couple of days, we've heard from Iran that they are hesitant to sign a final nuclear deal unless the economic sanctions are lifted full stop. And at the same time, we're seeing some Democrats in the White House maybe look to water down the Iran bill. What for you is the key lens through which to look at these discussions? Um, I would say it's the breakout time. If I'm looking from the straightforward uh, threat, nuclear threat angle, I think the breakout time issue, there's some confusion around it. And that would be the main uh, factor, I think, to look at. The Iranians are talking about using their most advanced centrifuges once the deal starts. Now, there's a lot of puffery here, but I don't think it's an area where you can take any risks. So there seems to have been an agreement to disagree between the sides almost at this point because of the lack of transparency and the way the media is approaching this. Uh, but that, to me, would be the most important factor. Yeah, and even as I think about it, I I am mixed in my analysis, not of of what I think should happen, but rather of how the negotiations are going and how it's being reported on. Because on the one hand, deeply, I do feel that we're all better off if Iran does not have nuclear weapons. At the same time, my logical and pragmatic side can't ignore that there's a sort of arbitrary nature to determining who is allowed to have nuclear weapons and who is allowed to decide who else is allowed to have nuclear weapons or not. Let's talk about that a little bit. Do you think that there's any sort of uh, capricious or arbitrary nature to that? There might be. I don't think in this context there is, given the behavior and ideology of Iran. Uh, Iran is a country that is now involved in a near genocide in Syria that has participated in assassinations in Lebanon on top of making that country into a Hezbollah base. It's killed thousands of American soldiers through its insurgents in Iraq. It's destabilizing Yemen. It supported Hamas. It's participated in terror attacks in South America, in Europe. Given that, uh, I don't think people will be sleeping well at night if the Iranians have a nuke. It will probably cause an arms race in the Middle East. As opposed to Israel, which has nuclear weapons, uh, and people often point to that as a, an unfair thing. Why is Israel not being scrutinized? But Israel's had nuclear weapons for decades and nobody's really worrying about them because of the context of the government. But the, as much there's as some, there's some them. subjectivity to this, though. And let me so let's contextualize. I don't disagree with any of the facts that you've stated about Iran just now. At the same time, we could decide, OK, the standard for um, being a, a sort of credible participant in these talks could be, have you threatened to, new, to use nuclear weapons or have you threatened to attack countries? But just as arbitrarily, we could say, listen, if you've used nuclear weapons, you can't participate in these talks. And that would rule out the United States. And that yes. would not be an unfair standard to apply. Uh, it wouldn't be. It would be a bit too late at that point, I would think. But uh, I think democracy, I might be a bit old school on this, but I think democracy, some kind of verifiable dem democratic government that's more accountable to its people might be a standard. In effect, the world is just trying to slow down the spread of nuclear weapons, but it's failed, right? You have India and Pakistan in the last two decades who have had nuclear tests. You have the, Kore the North Koreans. So uh, it is absolutely arbitrary if you're looking at who has nuclear weapons now. Uh, but I think if we want to set a standard, democracy would be probably a solid one, you know, civil liberties. Let's talk a little bit now about the role of Benjamin Netanyahu within all of this. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's any secret to you. It's no secret to my audience that while those on uh, the sort of anti Israeli side see me as a sort of forceful defender of Israel above all else, the reality is I'm incredibly critical of Benjamin Netanyahu. I think that he has no credibility as a potential arbiter of peace potential, but particularly because of the involvement of the extreme religious right uh, within his coalition in Israel. That being said, give us your sense right now of the the whether Benjamin Netanyahu hurts or helps the uh, movement to prevent Iran from having nuclear weapons, given that he has been sort of crying wolf about Iran for so long. And when I say crying wolf, I don't mean that I think it would be just great if Iran had nuclear weapons, but merely that he has been doing a lot of fear mongering around it. 
Mm -hmm. So I share a lot of your sentiment and I, I, if just a piece of unsolicited advice. If everybody disagrees with you, you're probably doing something right, especially when it comes to Israel. Um, I think Benjamin Netanyahu, whom I'm also extremely critical of, despite being afraid of Iran, is at this point not helping. Now, obviously, we don't have access to what's happening behind the scenes and what is happening on the intel level. Yeah. But the act of constantly crying from the sidelines uh, has turned into crying wolf. And it seems like people are not listening to Israel's message. And it is a very valid message. Israel's being threatened with genocide. Um, but somehow people are not listening because of his style, because of his other actions. And personally, um, I think that fear-mongering is the opposite of the way to go. There should be a projection of strength, if anything, to, to you know, build the morale of the Israeli public as opposed to bringing it down. And ultimately, at this point, he has lost all effectiveness. It may have been that at one point his threats led to tougher sanctions. Somehow, the, the, the rest of the countries were afraid he'd attack, so they put in tougher sanctions. At this point, I don't think anybody's listening to him, and I think a new voice would have helped more. I agree with you. And the latest polls in the U.S., which I have to say, I'm rarely surprised by poll results, but I was surprised that the uh, the number of people who feel that the, the relationship with Israel has, has turned sour, to kind of put it colloquially, and that could be a poll which says, that uh, Americans think that the U.S. maybe should not provide as much money to Israel or that the alliance at this point is maybe one that is not in the best interest. I point directly at Benjamin Netanyahu and his rhetoric as as a driving force in increased skepticism in the U.S. towards that relationship, which I don't like to see. Um, so I, I'm not sure we've seen the same polls. I think popular support in the U.S. remains quite high for Israel, but definitely the debacle over his Congress speech uh, which I think played directly into Obama's desire to weaken any chance of a, of a Congress bill that would stop this deal, um, didn't help. When you have controversy constantly with the prime minister uh, and the president, it's going to have an impact. That said, I think the public, the American public understands that there's a difference between the elected representative. He got 23% of the vote and the people. And I think support for the people of Israel is still very high, thankfully. Uh, in this country. And it's interesting because the same analysis could be applied to Iran, right, where we really have to distinguish between the rhetoric of the president and his administration, the rhetoric of the Ayatollah and the religious regime, which seems to be, according to every poll I've seen, I'm curious what you think, completely at odds with the priorities of the Iranian people who seem far more concerned with the benefits of, of dropping sanctions on their everyday lives than bombing other countries, certainly. Of course. Now, I think it's important to, to underline the vast difference qualitatively between the rhetoric of, of the Israeli prime minister who says it's too dangerous to have a Palestinian state now versus the Iranian leadership, which is talking about uh, death to America and eliminating Israel. No, no that question. Said, but my point merely is that if no. we're only going to analyze what officials say, we'll become disconnected right. from the sort of Absolutely. sentiment and, on the ground. And I think you point to a very important factor, which for me is a big concern, too immediately after the threshold issue. The Iranian population is not an anti-American population. They're actually very friendly in vast numbers to the American program, to the American ideal, and to the American people. And the idea that Iran would become an, a, a threshold, a nuclear threshold state, might stand in the way of regime change ultimately, because I don't expect Western countries to be in favor of regime change if that meant some instability regarding nukes in the Middle East. And I think there should be an angle to try to help the Iranian people get what they need, want, which is, as you correctly pointed out, to be reintegrated in the world, but also a liberalization of their regime. And uh, the Obama administration has bet against that. In 2009, there was the Green Revolution in Iran, and Obama was very tepid in his support of it uh, compared to how he was with Mubarak, Souster, and Gaddafi, etc. So it's a very sensitive point, and, and it's very, I'm very happy you bring it up because it shouldn't be forgotten. The Iranian people are our best bet. Last thing I want to touch on in the last bit of time we have here, when we look at if and when we have a permanent agreement, what's the next step in the sense that, of course, there's going to be this kind of uh, uh, watchful eye on what Iran does. Do they stick to the agreement? Do they not? But I'm having some trouble kind of projecting what the end game is more like five or ten years down the line. I think you and many others. Um, the first problem is that this deal in contrast to the deal in Syria, where there was a one-time kind of exchange or in a couple of steps of, of all the problematic material, here you're depending on good faith from the Iranians. And 
you know, inspection regimes that they could cheat or push back on or avoid. And in two, three years, once this has been forgotten by the top echelons, if Iran cheats, you're not going to have the West being willing to re-implement sanctions, which take years, or doing a strike. So there's a problem here, and I think the solution would have been to try to do a, a, a grand bargain, as they call it, to try to strike a deal with Iran that brings it back into the family of nations, if that's possible, and deal with all the outstanding issues. So you have a stronger set of commitments. For example, no more uh, support for insurgencies in the Middle East, no more belligerent uh, talk with uh, Israel, and in exchange you can have free, ex free uh, trade agreements, all kinds of things that give the Iranian people what they want, and they deserve, I think. All right, we're going to continue following the discussions. And of course, if and when we have a finalized agreement, we'll be continuing to discuss it. We've been speaking with Philippe Assouline, international relations expert. Thanks again for being on. Thank you very much for having me.